Tonight's lesson is dealing with a new creation, and if you have your Bibles, you might turn to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, a passage that should be familiar to every Christian, really. When Paul writes, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, or a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. In noticing the background of this verse, the Apostle Paul has been dealing with one of his favorite themes that you see repeatedly through his writings, his sermons that he preached, and that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He had, as he oftentimes did, been arguing that Christ's death upon the cross was not an end in itself. It was a necessary step in that salvation process, but it was a necessary step for the resurrection to take place, a resurrection to a new, a glorified life. And... Through that resurrection, Paul would write in Romans 1 and verse 4 that he proved himself to be the Son of God through that resurrection. The conclusion thus, that as Christ died and as Christ was raised from the dead, so also we must die in order to be raised. And that's what we're dealing with here in this passage. But it's also a theme that we see in Romans the sixth chapter. As we start that chapter, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? That so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism, that like as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. And so Paul, in this passage as well, talks about here we are dying with Christ in that act of baptism, and as Christ was raised from the dead, we are raised out of that watery grave of baptism, and as Christ was lived a new glorified life, we live a new glorified life that is separate and apart from sin. We see the same idea being presented in Colossians 3 and verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, if ye been risen with Christ. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about our resurrection from that watery grave of baptism. And when you're raised from Christ, what do you do? Well, you don't live like the world, and you don't think like the world. You don't seek the things that the world seeks. You've got to change a new glorified life in which we seek the things of God and not the things of men. And so we come back to the text of our lesson in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things, and you go back to these other passages that we've just read and looked at, there's the old things that were before baptism. Those things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What is it? We now live a new glorified life where we are seeking those things above, where we're no longer living for sin and in sin. We're living separate and apart from sin. So it's the same theme that Paul repeatedly discusses throughout his epistles, a theme that thus is important to us and should be important to us. But we want to look at that phrase, in Christ, first off, 
This phrase, in Christ, is an expression that is used to indicate an approved an acceptable relationship with God. It is used more often by Paul than any, of the, any other inspired writer. In fact, Paul uses it so often that some have called it the monogram of Paul. It's used at least 132 times by Paul in his writings. So it is a repeated use that he has of this phrase, in Christ. Now, it might be in him or in whom, but it's always dealing with Christ. And so in him, it's in Christ. In Christ, in whom. So however he might express it, still it's dealing with in, being in Christ, being in this approved relationship with God. Let's notice a few of those examples of Paul's use of this phrase. In Romans, the 8th chapter, in verse 1, Paul would say, Therefore, or there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now then, you can go back to what we were discussing as we were introducing the, this part as to that act of baptism where we die to, that, to the flesh. We're no longer walking after the flesh. We're raised to that new glorified body. What is it? We're walking after the Spirit, after the instructions that the Spirit gives within the Word of God. And so as we're doing that, what is it? We're in that approved relationship with God. We, have, we are in Christ. But he says in that approved relationship with God, being in Christ, we have no condemnation. We do not stand condemned before God when we are in Christ. There's the point that Paul is making. Someone who's not in that approved relationship, they are condemned before God. But now then in Christ we will not be condemned. We do not stand that way because we are walking after the Spirit and not after the flesh. We've been raised from that watery grave of baptism to walk in that newness of life. Here in our text that we're using in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, he says there that we are a new creature in Christ. And so we center upon that aspect. We are a new creature and again, the old things are passed away, all things are become new. There's that new creature. The old man has died, and now then we're living that new glorified life. We are that new creature, but it's found in Christ Jesus. Outside of Christ, we're not a new creature. We're still that old man of sin. No longer, or we're not in that newness of life, we're in that oldness of life. In Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 26, Paul would write, For ye are all the children of God by faith, and literally it's by the faith in Christ Jesus. And we'll come back to that aspect of being of the faith. But we're children of God. How? By the faith in Christ Jesus. When we are in Christ, when we are in that approved relationship with God, we are children of God. Thus, we are going to be the recipients of all of those blessings that God gives. We're going to be the recipients of His gifts that He's going to give. And is in the inheritance that he has to give unto those who are his children, which is going to be eternal life. But we're children of God. We could, we won't take the time this evening, but you could very well look at the aspect of if we are children of God, then we're going to have to look like God. How are we going to look like God? By partaking of his divine nature. St. Peter 1 and verse 3. 
How are we going to be partaker of his divine nature? Well, one, we escape the corruption that's in this world through lust. That's dying to that old man of sin. And we add the Christian graces that he talks about there in St. Peter 1, verse 5 through 7. That's how we are being a partaker of the divine nature. What is it? We're being a child of God. We look like him. We are to speak like him. We talked yesterday about the aspect we're to speak the same thing. Well, we're to speak God's word. What is it? We speak like him. Why? Because we're children of God. And so we're going to speak like him. We're going to look like him. We're going to act like him. We're going to speak like him. Our entire life becomes God in us. And then now what Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And for me to live is Christ. To die is God. And just think of all of those many passages that deal with that very subject that Paul writes about. Why? Because we're children of God. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, and again in Colossians 1 and verse 14, he writes, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then in the Ephesian letter, he adds, According to the riches of his grace. The in whom there, of course, dealing with in Christ. In this approved relationship with God, what do we have? We have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's one thing. The second thing, we have the forgiveness of our sins in Christ. We're redeemed in Christ Jesus, though. The idea of redemption is a buying back. We were slaves of sin. We were in sin, slaves of sin and of Satan. God, through his generous mercy, and as there in Ephesians 1, 7, according to the riches of his grace... Because of his grace, he sent his son to die upon the cross to buy us back to himself, to redeem us from all iniquity. And thus we have the forgiveness of our sins. Our sins are forgiven. They are washed away in Christ Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10 thus, Paul would say, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So here's salvation now that we have, where? In Christ. When we are in Christ, when we are in that approved relationship with God, we have salvation. And here obviously he's talking about eternal salvation because of with eternal glory. We can be saved. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ when we are in Christ Jesus. Paul sums it up very beautifully for us in Ephesians 1 and verse 3. When he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which or who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. There's the summation of it, that in Christ we have all spiritual blessings. There are no spiritual blessings outside of Christ. And just as an aside here, I hear so many times preachers mistakenly talking about, well, someone out here who's not a member of the Lord's church, but he's seeking, he, God's going to hear his prayer. Hogwash! No way. Why? Because he doesn't have any access to the Father. His Father is still Satan, not God. That's his spiritual Father, John 8 and verse 44. Prayer is a spiritual blessing, and to have that privilege of prayer to the Father, you have to be in Christ, not outside of Christ but he's dealing with every spiritual blessing is found in Christ. And then he uses the phrase also in the heavenly places or in the heavenlies. As you study the Ephesian letter and also Hebrew letter, you see that this idea of in the heavenlies is dealing with the church. So when you're in the church, when you're in Christ, you have all spiritual blessings. 
Now then the question, of course, well, how do we get in Christ, into Christ? If we have all of these blessings in Christ, we need to know how to get into him. Well, there's two passages in all of the Bible that tells us how to get into Christ, and only two. Romans 6, verse 3 Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? There's the one passage. We're baptized into Jesus Christ. Now, all of these blessings are in that location of Christ, but to get into Christ, he says, it's through baptism. In Galatians, the third chapter and verse 27, thus. We see, for as many of you as been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And so again, the two passages in all of the Bible, the only two passages that tell us how to get into that place where all of these spiritual blessings are, into Christ where we are in that approved relationship with God, is through that act of baptism. And that is scriptural baptism, when it's predicated upon a proper faith, a proper repentance from one's sins, and a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, it takes an understanding, as we would see in Acts the 8th chapter, of our knowledge that Christ is that one who has authority, and a knowledge of the church, the kingdom. When they believe those things, the name of Jesus Christ or the authority of Christ in the kingdom, then they were baptized. That's scriptural baptism then. And when they are baptized, they are placed into Christ where all of these spiritual blessings reside. But I want us to notice some spiritual comparisons now. Going back to several of these passages that we've referred to, and make a spiritual comparison in relationship to it. In Romans 8 and verse 1, we started with that, that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, that you not walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. We see the application of that, though, when we are baptized into Jesus Christ. Notice 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. At the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the, what is, the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here is the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's what having no condemnation brings. When I have no condemnation, I stand not condemned by God, I have a good conscience. That's the result of that no condemnation. But how does it come? It comes in that act of baptism. When we are baptized into Christ, that's when we have that no condemnation. Because we're now in that state of having a good conscience before God. And so baptism puts us into that location where we have no condemnation. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, the passage that we began with, we noted that we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. That old things are passed away, all things are become new. Well, we hinted at this at the beginning but again, notice the aspect of baptism in relationship to becoming a new creature. Now, in Christ, we are a new creature. But look at Romans 6 and verse 4. When he says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That newness of life is that being a new creature. You cannot separate the two. Now, how does it come? When we are baptized into Christ, then we are a new creature. We are now walking in newness of life, a new creature, so that those old things passed away and all things are become new. 
Why? Where? In Christ Jesus. But it's baptism that places us in that relationship with God. And it's baptism that places us where we are now, a new creature. You cannot become a new creature without the act of baptism, placing us into Christ. In Galatians 3 and verse 26, we noted that we are children of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. Again, we see though the application of that is in baptism. The very next verse, verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's an interesting word in the original here. The word that's translated for in Galatians 3.27. The word for can be, for example, in Acts 2.38. It's translated from the Greek word ace or ice, however it's people uh, pronounce it different ways. and So whichever way you want to pronounce it, that's fine with me. I have enough trouble pronouncing English. But that word ace or ice means unto or in order to. It's always looking forward to. And so in Acts 2.38, Peter says, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Looking forward to the remission of sins. That's the word ace. It's also found in Matthew 26 chapter because every once in a while someone comes along and says, oh no, the word for there in Acts 2.38 means because of. But in Matthew 26 and verse 28, we have the exact same construction, both in the English and the Greek, by the way. And so it's going to mean the same thing, isn't it? But in Matthew 26 and verse 28... Jesus is saying, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ was going to shed his blood, why? So that people could have the remission of sins. It's something in the future. He wasn't going to shed his blood because people were already saved. How foolishness. Well, that's the word ace or ice. But that's not the word that's translated for here. Here it's the Greek word gar. And the word gar means for the reason, or here is the reason. He's giving you the reason for something. Now then, when you go back to this in verse 26 and 27, you're children of God by the faith, that is God's word, in Christ Jesus, now here's the reason you're a, children, a child of God. You've been baptized into Christ. That's how you become a child of God, through the act of baptism. You cannot become a child of God and thus a recipient of all of the blessings that God is going to give, an inheritance, uh, and that includes that inheritance of God, without that act of baptism. Here's the way you became a child of God. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. But then, we also noted that we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. Again, Ephesians 1 and verse 7 and Colossians 1 and verse 14, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. But again, you see that redemption, that forgiveness of sins in the act of baptism. We just mentioned Acts 2 and verse 38. When Peter's response to the, peop to the Jews whom he had convicted of their sins of crucifying the, the Son of God. And they cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter's response, repent, be baptized, every one of you. Why? so that you can have the remission of sins. That's why. What is it? But that comes by the blood of Christ. That, that is found when you're in Christ Jesus. Well, what puts you in Christ Jesus? It's that act of baptism, and so when you're baptized, what do you have? You have the remission of your sins. 
You cannot separate the remission of sins from the act of baptism. No wonder Ananias, when he would come to Saul at that time, Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, and as recorded in Acts 22 and verse 16, he tells him, Why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. The way in which you call upon the name of the Lord is not to say, Lord, Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord is an action. It's not a verbalization. The action is in that act of baptism. That's how we call upon the name of the Lord. But in that calling upon the name of the Lord and in that act of baptism, we are washing away our sins. That's what forgiveness is all about. That's what remission is about, where we have the washing away of those sins. Our sins are upon us, but in that act of baptism, those sins are washed away. They have been forgiven now. We no longer stand, again, going back to that which we read in Romans 8 and verse 1, we no longer stand condemned before God. Why? Because we've been baptized into Christ Jesus. Thus in Christ, we found that we have salvation. Say in Timothy 2 and verse 10, that therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And so here is the salvation that comes as a result of being in Christ in that approved relationship. But again, we see the application of that in the act of baptism. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Now the denominational world would come along and say the like figure whereunto even baptism doth not now save us. Now that's what they teach, but that's not what the scriptures say. They do exactly the same thing that Satan did in the long ago in the Garden of Eden when he says, Ye shall not surely die. When God says, yeah, sure, Thou wilt surely die. Baptism doth also now save us. But wait, I thought salvation came through the blood of Jesus Christ and when we were in Christ. It does. But the application of that is seen in that act of baptism. When we are baptized into Christ, we then have forgiveness and we have salvation. Look at what Jesus would say in giving the Great Commission in Mark the 16th chapter and verse 16, that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I've asked many denominational people on Facebook groups and in discussing baptism and its necessity for the remission of sins, and even in person and talking to denominational people, where did Jesus place baptism in Mark 16, verse 16, before or after salvation? Very few will ever answer it. I finally got one person to answer it, and he said both. So it reads, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and is to be baptized. I had one person say that Jesus placed baptism after salvation. And I kind of shook a second, and that's not what it says. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's just your interpretation. <laughs> that is exactly what was stated over and over and over and over. I'm not interpreting, I'm just reading it. That's your interpretation. No, it's baptism is for salvation. The one who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now that's what Jesus says. Now we can accept Jesus' word or we can reject it. But I thought salvation was in Christ Jesus. It is. But that application is seen when we are baptized in Jesus Christ. 
we summed up all of these spiritual blessings in saying in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 that we have all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Now, as I mentioned very briefly at the time, the idea of heavenly places or the heavenlies refers to the church. In Ephesians, as you continue to study throughout, through this book, you see the phrase is used by Paul to deal with the church. Specifically in Hebrews the 8th chapter and the 9th chapter, Paul uses this phrase in relationship to the church, the heavenly places, not only dealing with heaven, but the dealing with the church itself. And when you see, for example, in chapter 1 of Ephesians, in verse 22 and 23, that God hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That the church is the fullness of Christ. Thus, when you're in Christ, you're in the church. When you're in the church, you're in Christ. Now, then we could ask the question, how do we get into the church thus? Well, obviously, you vote somebody into the church, don't we? Well, that's what some denominations say, and that's the way in which they practice it. Come and tell us your experience, and we'll vote on it. How do you get into the church? According to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For by one spirit. This is not talking about there about spirit baptism as some would have us believe. Pentecostals in particular have taken the position that this has reference to spirit baptism. No, it doesn't. The idea is that it is not the spirit into which you are being baptized, but he is the instrument. It is his word that he has given, and thus through that instrumentation of the word of God, we're being baptized into the body. The body is the church, though, as we already noted in Ephesians 1, and 23. Thus we're baptized according to the spirit's instructions into the church, into the body. That's how we get into the church, where all spiritual blessings are. In Acts, the second chapter, we referenced it a minute ago. Here's Peter on this great day of Pentecost, preaching this great gospel sermon, in which he proves to the Jews that Jesus was the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead. They had by wicked hands crucified him and slain him. But God raised him from the dead set him at his own right hand so that he now sits and rules as king. And thus he has proven him to be the Son of God. He's proven him to be the Christ and Lord. And so they were convicted of their sins and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter tells them to repent, be baptized for the remission of your sins. He continues on to exhort them and plead with them to save yourselves from this untoward generation. Those that gladly received the word were baptized. What were they baptized into? Well, they were baptized into the church because we find in verse 47 that the Lord was adding to the church daily those that were being saved. And so here is those individuals who were being saved. How? By their act of baptism because that baptism saves us. 1 Peter 3, 21, Mark 16, 16. And what were they added to? They were added to the church, verse 47. And so how do we get into the church? When we are baptized into Christ, we're being baptized into the church, which is the fullness of Christ. And in that church, then, we have all spiritual blessings. How dare anyone denigrate the church of our Lord. That is where we have all spiritual blessings. That is where we have salvation. 
That is where we have no condemnation. That is where we have all of these spiritual blessings that we've talked about this evening. And it takes place when we are baptized into Christ. But then, in our text, he says that we are a new creature. New creation. How is this new creation made known? Through a lifestyle. The old things are passed away. All things are become new. Again, look at Romans 6, chapter and verse 6. Knowing this, that an old man, say, old things are passed away. The old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. There's that old man. He's crucified with Christ. He's raised up out of that watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life, verse 4. What is it? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Brethren, there's more to being a Christian than simply getting into Christ. It's living then the Christian life. One must be that new creature, that new creation where old things are passed away and now then he is yielding his members as instruments of righteousness unto God, Romans 6 and verse 13, and no longer yielding himself unto sin, because that old man is now dead, he's died in that watery grave of baptism, and that individual has been raised in Christ now in the church to live that new lifestyle, a lifestyle that is living in dedication and consecration to God. Now then, one last point in conclusion. Because now when one is in Christ Jesus and those old things are passed away and behold all things are become new, there's also a new judgment. The judgment, he no longer stands condemned by God. This one who is now in Christ has salvation, eternal glory. And so he can look forward to that judgment in which he's going to be judged and he's going to hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. Why? Because he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. All things are become new. He's had the remission of his sins in that act of baptism where he's been raised to walk in that newness of life. And so that judgment is new. Instead of standing condemned before God, where he would hear those words, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire. Judgment is new. And now then he can hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Those are words you're going to hear on the judgment scene. Will you hear Christ say, Well done, or you hear him say, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. The decision is ours. Are you a new creature in Christ Jesus? Have you been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? Baptized to be saved? Baptized into the church of our Lord where all spiritual blessings are? Baptized into Christ where all spiritual blessings are? If you haven't, we would plead with you to do that this evening. Accept that invitation of our Lord to come unto Him and receive the rest that He has to offer. If you have become a Christian, but you haven't lived that lifestyle of seeking those things above where Christ sitteth, and having died to that old man of sin, maybe you've gone back into that old man of sin and you need to repent of your sins this evening and come back unto him and once again be restored to faithfulness to God so that you can hear those good words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And if you need to respond to that invitation to come to him, to let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins, and our Lord is there, our God is waiting, and he's ready to forgive. He is ready to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and all sin if we will but come to him. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation.